Our last two lessons on Edmund Burke will be mostly bonus material. In this video, I'll talk about the efficient cause, which I'll explain in a moment. And in the last uh, video, I'll talk about Burke's views on language, which are quite interesting. So far, though, we've seen what his core theory is of the sublime and the beautiful. At the end of his essay, he tries to give us a kind of scientific explanation for how these effects are created at the level of the body. He calls this the efficient cause, and this comes to us from Aristotle. This is Aristotelian language. Okay, so Aristotle came up with four causes. It may be easiest if I give a quick example here. Um, if you take something like a chair, for instance, right? There's our chair. Aristotle would say there are four causes. The first is the material. Every chair needs to be made from different materials like wood or leather or metal, whatever you want to use. We also have the formal formal cause, which very roughly is the shape of the chair, the, the, the kind of uh, object it is. Then we have the efficient cause which is how the chair was made. Maybe we need a hammer, we need nails, maybe we need to have a carpenter if we can't do it ourselves. So that's the efficient cause. And the final cause, the final cause is the purpose or the goal for which the chair is made, which might be to sit on, to have a rest, to do work on, who knows what that final cause might ultimately be. So let's have a look then at our efficient cause when it comes to the sublime and the beautiful. How is it created? Well, Burke argues that the sublime and the beautiful start through start with the senses, right? We experience things like pain and pleasure, and then that leads to, to physical reactions. And by physical, he really means that we have reactions at the level of the nerves and the muscles. At this level, we have a very physical reaction. Burke argues that the body tends to react in one of two ways. Either we tense up, we tense up, our, bo our bodies actually contract, uh, and having dealt with nervousness and stress myself, I know this is true, right? Your, your back tenses up, you get a headache. Um, well, if your neck tenses up, uh, these things are certainly real. On the other hand, we sometimes also relax. Burke gives this wonderful example of what it looks like to fall in love when your body relaxes. He says your head tilts to one side, your eyes glaze over, uh, you're, you're weak in the knees, so on and so forth. It's quite a humorous uh, description, actually, of what it means to fall in love. Burke then argues, not surprisingly, that when we tense up, we are more likely to experience the sublime as we experience moments of horror and astonishment and so on. And when we relax, we are more likely to experience beauty. Or we could put it the other way, the experience of beauty is relaxing. So it's not just a one-way street here, right? It's, it kind of goes the other way as well. Okay, now Burke complicates this picture a little bit by also talking about rest and labor. He says both of these things are good in moderation, and if we don't do it in moderation, then when we rest too much, our bodies become weak, and when we work too much, our minds become weak, uh, and we can't think properly. He suggests that we need both of these, and when it comes to the sublime, then, the sublime is a kind of labor. It's an exercise of our finer feelings. This is a kind of theory that might remind you of Aristotle again, because Aristotle, when he talked about catharsis, suggested also, um, at least this is what some critics have, have made of it, Aristotle suggested that the experience of catharsis is a kind of cleansing, purgation, uh, which then trains the feelings so that we become more adept at recognizing our feelings and more in control of them. Okay, um, so this is kind of the basic outline then of Burke's theory. There's one more thing that we should note before we jump to some examples, and that's the problem that, and this is a problem that Burke does not really resolve, it's the problem that 
um, this reaction to our environment might be either passive, it just happens to us, or it could be that we actually have self-control, that we can control our emotions and our muscles. Burke seems quite conflicted about this. Which one is it? He gives this wonderful example of a man who could so much control his nerves and muscles that he could face torture without feeling any pain. Because as long as the muscles don't contract and he doesn't tense up, the mind doesn't experience any pain. It seems quite ludicrous, but Burke seems fascinated by it. Um, on the other hand, Burke also often argues that our experience of nature and of our environment is quite passive. These things just happen to us and we can't really control them. Which one is it then? Burke isn't always entirely clear. We said then that this whole theory is rooted in the senses and Burke talks about a number of different experiences that the senses have where senses tense up or relax uh, and I'm going to focus specifically on vision here because he spends most of his time talking about how sight works, and uh, it's fairly easy to explain, I think. Although, since I'm not a scientist, I'm not sure how true it is. Uh, it would be very interesting to see if any scientists have taken Burke up on this and have discussed this in more detail. So, Burke argues that if you look at these top two uh, photos, the, the left one is of Mount Robson in Canada, a very majestic mountain, um, which I've seen myself. It's a beautiful, beautiful mountain. Uh, and on the right we have this field of flowers, Burke would argue that the left photo is much more sublime, right? And he argues that the way in which this image hits the eye uh, causes a lot of strain on the eye. So seeing the mountain like this causes strain. When something is really big, the mind struggles to take it in. The eye has to strain to kind of make sense of all this information, this large object. And either it focuses on the whole thing or it focuses on one part of it, which is still quite difficult to uh, deal with. On the other hand, if we look at the, the picture on the right, when we have variety, okay, when we have variety, the mind tends to, or the eye tends to relax. It can't focus on everything anyways, so it just kind of relaxes and it's a pleasurable experience. Something similar happens with darkness, according to Burke. When we are looking at a night sky, uh, we find the experience jarring. His reasoning is quite interesting. He suggests that when something is dark, first of all, the blackness is a kind of absence of light, which means that at first our mind starts to relax. But then there's this almost primal fear where we think we are relaxing too much and we suddenly jump out of it. It's startling, it's jarring. Berg gives the example of sitting down on a chair and suddenly realizing that the chair is lower than we thought. That change of expectation is what creates this jarring moment. And Berg suggests that for the eye, looking at darkness, it's the same thing. By the way, Burke also has this interesting theory about dreaming. He says dreaming is similar in that your mind starts to relax, it falls into darkness, and then there's this moment where the body goes, whoa, wait a second, this is scary, uh, this is way too relaxing. And then because of that jarring moment, we start to have dreams. Certainly an interesting theory. Finally, when it comes to sight, Burke talks about regularity, these pillars that go on uh, on and on, one of his favorite examples of the sublime. And here again, we have an example of strain. Because each one is the same as we look on, the, it kind of builds to a crescendo, right? One after the other. If all these pillars were different, our mind could relax, but that is not the case here. That gives you a sense then of how Burke treats one of the senses with all these different examples, but it's really the same theory. It's still the same idea about strain of, or, or relaxing, and that goes back then to um, uh, ultimately to our muscles contracting or easing up. We can say the same thing about things like hearing and taste. Uh, so Burke says, for instance, if you listen to a foghorn in the night, that anticipation where you know the sound is coming again, that creates strain in your muscles. 
And the same thing for taste. Rough uh, textures tend to create strain and smooth and sweet uh, food, let's say, that tends to relax us. It sounds quite plausible, but it is also very simplistic. <laughs> we just have these two different um, experiences and emotions. I, I think the biggest takeaway here is that Burke is trying to give us some kind of scientific explanation for what happens when it comes to the sublime and the beautiful. And in that, he, he probably is ahead of his time. Uh, it's certainly a fascinating insight.